All right, I'm going to talk about Hans Kuhn's uh, book, Infallibility and Inquiry. Hans Kuhn was a uh, Catholic priest, theologian, and teacher, and he lost his teaching position on account of writing this book. So he talked about uh, infallibility in the post-conciliar church, and of course, uh, he's not allowed to question that openly, so he says, oh, it's just an inquiry. Well, you'll find that the, that's the theme of the whole book, that... Um, constantly wars against the idea of infallibility, but always, always, always hedges in terms of an inquiry so that he's not um, called out as a, a blatant heretic. So I wrote an outline in the book, about the book, and I'm going to follow that right now. So what is the cause? What is the uh, casus belli? What is the the impetus for writing this book, basically the, uh, the issuance of Humana Vitae caused a lot of Catholics to bring into question the idea of infallibility uh, because the Pope, you know, with the stroke of a pen reaches into the, the marital lives and the bedrooms of, you know, a billion plus Catholics. And so that he can do this, without much accountability caused a lot of people, you know, gave a lot of people a, a moment to, to pause and ask this question. Is an encyclical infallible? And truth be told, there has never been, never once been an, an infallible encyclical. So he delves into that. He says that uh, basically the encyclical became, during this time frame, post, post-council, the encyclical went from being a tried-and-true authoritative marching order to simply a moment and an excuse, or you could say an opportunity to reflect on conscience. So nothing in the encyclical requires obedience, but you're required to stop and to examine your conscience and then follow your conscience. So how do we get to this point? Well, Infallibility was uh, defined uh, in and around 1870, the First Vatican Council. Hans Kuhn begins with a critique of the council. He says that it was not free, that it was possessed with a, a spirit or an animosity against um, uh, modernism, and it was thought by all, at, at, all, all present at the council that the best antidote to modernism was an infallible pope, a pope that could simply... Uh, decree certain things to be wrong, contrary to God, and to simply give marching orders to hundreds of millions of Catholics to operate in the world against uh, this up-and-coming modern modernism. He says, ultimately, the Vatican I failed to address the proper questions. He says that the, the Holy Spirit does not act as a deus ex machina to save a council from its own missteps, that uh, it was a poorly constructed council, poorly prepared, and ultimately dominated by the Curia and, and the Pope to achieve a, um, a prefabricated end. Well, 100 years transpires between V1 and V2, that's Vatican II. Vatican II attempts to address some of the shortcomings of Vatican I. Vatican I you know your history was cut off short by an invasion of the papal states uh, vatican ii addresses in regard to papal infallibility it addresses the role of the college of bishops in regard to infallibility and that papal pronouncements should be accompanied with um a conference with the with the college of bishops however it does restate that the bishops are not necessary the pope can actually act and declare and decree contrary to the bishops, contrary to the entire church, if he so pleases. And so V2 doesn't really fix anything. Uh, it retains for the Pope a full plenitude of power, full prerogatives, no real change affected. And so um, going into the council, there was tremendous hope that the draconian rules surrounding uh, contraception, the draconian rules surrounding priestly celibacy would be overturned. Uh, there was some hinting of that within the council itself, but the uh, the Pope would not permit the document to touch on those matters. He reserved official pronouncements for those things to himself. So he established, uh, you could say, like a privy council, a research council that was supposed to be secret. 
and we're supposed to research um, contraception, both theologically, scientifically, and practically, to see if church teaching could change. And he intended to stack the council with his own guys just to come to a pre-established conclusion. Um, finally, under certain pressure, once it was made public, once that council was made public under pressure, he had to put actual experts and um, and a variety of other members so that we could have a more objective conclusion. Now, contrary to his intentions, that council returns back the, the answer that there is no theological justification any longer for restricting birth control, that there are legitimate scientific, uh, relational, marital, and theological reasons to permit it. He scraps it all. He says, uh, you know, that's all well and good, but we're going to retain the, the traditional teaching. And why? Well, it's admitted by other people, other members of the Curia later on, that they could not make a change to uh, issues regarding contraception without admitting that the church had been wrong for hundreds of years. And you cannot preserve any dogma of infallibility if, if the Pope has been wrong for the past several hundred years. And so what happens is that per, to preserve the dogma of infallibility for the Pope, they retain uh, very outmoded ways of thinking regarding contraception. And so Humana Vitae is the product of this effort to save infallibility. All right, so Hans Kuhn jumps into, in the, the latter, you could say third of the book, Hans Kuhn jumps into a critique of the very meaning of infallibility. He says that most people confuse infallibility with indefectibility. So the, the idea that the church cannot ultimately fail. He said that the church can be indefectible without being infallible. He says that uh, there is an inherent fallibility in any written pronouncement because of the limitations of language and the differences of culture. The differences of the individuals and cultures that receive the pronouncement. There is an inherent fallibility. Um, by virtue of the hearers, by virtue of those who, in, who are interpreting. Um, he says that even councils are fallible, and this is readily acknowledged by the Eastern Orthodox, who incorporate a reception theory, but more on that in a minute. He says that many councils that were intended as ecumenical were rejected, like Ephesus II is called a robber council. There are many councils that were not intended as anything more than local councils that are nevertheless in the centuries which uh, proceed, they're accepted as ecumenical. And so he says that um, there's nothing inherent within a council that would cause it to be infallible except for the reception of that council by the entire church in the subsequent years and generations then only after it's been received do you know that it's, that it's infallible. It also says that the teaching office is a novelty, so the idea that the Pope would be anything more than an administrator or a servant uh, is, is modern. The idea that he would be a source of infallible dogma is a modern teaching, and it really grows out of the Counter-Reformation era of the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, he says, ultimately, infallibility is to be found in... The people of God, that is the church, its clergy, and its laity together, that you cannot call something infallible. For instance, humana vitae, you cannot call that infallible if ultimately 95 plus percent of the church rejects it. I think that's fair. Um, his reception theory is essentially the same as Eastern Orthodox or similar enough. He says that infallibility um, although infallibility may not be desirable or possible, it nevertheless plays no role in indefectibility. Indefectibility is something different. And infallibility is ultimately found in the collective people of God, that what they receive as a whole is true, and what they reject it cannot be true, cannot be, cannot be infallible. He ends with a note on the ideal pope. His ideal pope is a servant not simply an infallible tyrant, not simply a source of infallible dogma. For him, John the Twenty-Third was the ideal pope, but Paul the Sixth failed to uh, walk in John the Twenty-Third's footsteps. John the Twenty-Third made a point of never trying to be infallible, never trying to make a pronouncement 
that could be regarded as utterly irreformable. And now, you know, he says all that in so many words. He hedges quite a bit all along the way so that he cannot be charged with being a total heretic. He did lose his teaching office over this. I will read two more of his books. Uh, he wrote another one called Can the Catholic Church Be Saved? And then he wrote a, a, a book titled The Catholic Church uh, Short History. I want to read both of those as time allows. Um, but concerning time, uh, I didn't really have time to read this book. So I used to be what was called a completionist. If, if I cracked open a book, I was going to read the the introduction, the preface, the text, the epilogue, the afterwards, the bibliography. I was going to read it all because um, I, I had this like pathological need to complete books and to leave any part of it undone uh, bothered my OCD. And I've gotten away from that much, much because I've just gotten older. And it was Samuel Johnson who said something like, he said this to James Boswell. He said, read all that you can while you're young, because when you're older, reading will become a bother. And it is. Uh, reading is an inconvenience and a nuisance much of the time because uh, it's very hard to find the peace and the time to do it. Um, and it's something that kind of weighs on me. It's on my to-do list. So with this book, in the last third of the book, when I realized that Hans Kuhn was using a lot of excess of verbiage to get his point across, I realized that I could probably just skim the rest of the book and do just fine. And that's what I found, and that's what I discovered, that for the last 80 pages, I skimmed through it, and I looked at uh, chapter headings, I looked at uh, words and italics, skimmed the pages for a keyword. Sometimes I slowed down to read, read whole pages, sometimes I slowed down to read whole paragraphs. And I don't feel that I missed anything. I feel I got a pretty good grasp of the book. My point is this, that um, whatever your condition is at present, if you're a completionist, you should be working to rid yourself of that. Life is too short. The books are too long. There's too many of them to read. And so I'll probably be utilizing that, uh, that trick a little more. Skimming for the high points, as long as I feel I grasp the the point of the book, the gist of the argument, then I'll just move on. There are a few books that I don't do that with. Uh, certain books are important in every jot and tittle. Uh, this was certainly not one. So that's just a point I thought I'd bring up. I did utilize some skimming to get through it. Uh, what's next on the docket? Oh, let's see. Uh, Zechariah Sitchin's uh, 12th Planet. Um, this book is a reinterpretation of biblical history in light of discoveries in Sanskrit of the Sumerian, Akkadian, Assyrian, and Babylonian empires, which is, uh, I've, I've read about a chapter or two. It's a good read so far, and it will shed light on uh, much that I'm studying in the Bible, much, much of the assumptions that Western Christianity has given me. Uh, many of those are simply anachronisms. They're false. And so to really dig deep into the text and to know what the original authors intended, uh, you really need to go back to um, the empires of Mesopotamia. But more on that later. This was Hans Kuhn, Infallibility and Inquiry. Um, hopefully it will, if you pick up this book, it will guide you to a more critical approach to your Catholicism. You do not have to believe everything the Pope says.